We are in Hebrews, finishing up chapter 2, and we're going to go a little bit into chapter 3. Uh, before we get going uh, on our study, are there any questions that you had from reading Hebrews on your own or from any of the studies that we've done thus far? We're all good? Okay. So let's go ahead and get in, start getting into it. Now, the uh, it wasn't last week, it was two weeks ago. Uh, we were getting towards the end of chapter 2, and the, the basic summary of what we were looking at was the way that we are part of, uh, of God's family. So I'm just going to real quick do, a, do a, a recap of the things there. And now since the chil- uh, children have flesh and blood in common, this is verse 14, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil. Now obviously we know that Satan doesn't doesn't control death. He doesn't hold death. What it's talking about here is he holds the power of death. In other words, the the the, the fear of death, the intimidation of it. The the you know he's able to use it for his own purposes. Um, so Jesus became like us to free us from fear of death and to make sin uh, uh, Satan ineffective. Uh, so those two things there, verse fifteen, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. And obviously we looked at this before. That doesn't mean we don't experience fear. You are going to have times of fear of death, okay? So uh, the, di- the difference b- being that fear is, is, is un- unbased on anything, okay? So uh, in other words, there is hope beyond the fear. Now, I will say this. If you are in a time right now in your life where you are afraid to die, there's a real good chance that it's because it's not your time to die yet. <laughs> I know a lot of times people have gotten really upset. Oh, no, I'm, as- I'm afraid to die. Are you dying? Like... <laughs> Don't worry about it. You know, when, it, when I've seen most Christians, when they get to that point in their life, you know, uh, they're able to uh, to trust God through it, and it obviously changes things. So, Hebrews two sixteen, for it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offering offspring. So he became flesh and blood for flesh and blood, not for angels, of of course, whom Satan is an angel. So then, that's verse seventeen, and that's where we left off last time. We're at verse seventeen. So. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. Now, it started off that verse with therefore, uh, and what he's, what he's referencing is, is if you go back to those verses we just looked at, so the idea is in order to really help us, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way. And so there's kind of a little bit of a flow here, um, and I have it here on the screen. on the screen, okay, so... He couldn't have become our high priest without becoming a man. So God had to become a man, become like us, so that he could in turn become the high priest. And he had to become the high priest so that he could offer atonement. It's kind of like this, a little bit of a process here, which is why he said there in verse 17, in matters pertaining to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. Um, So, uh, obviously he couldn't have offered atonement if he wasn't, high, wasn't the priest. So uh, it says there that he was merciful in matters pertaining to God there in verse 17. Uh, I'm sorry, not, not that part. Uh, so he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, the, the two words there used, merciful, that's more in reference to us. That's, that's in his uh, interaction with us. He's merciful to us. Faithful, that's not faithfulness to us in the context. He's actually talking about faithfulness to his job. So he, he's faithful to the job of being the high priest and making atonement. Um, in other parts, he talks about God's faithfulness to us. But in this part, he's actually talking about the faith, uh, his, how he's faithful to the job that he's, he's, he has, the task, um, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. So obviously the, the faithfulness is to the atonement part. And that takes us to verse 18, which says, For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. We're going to have a little bit of a discussion on two different questions there. But before we get there, let's just kind of, I'll mention a couple things real quick. First off, so since the, what this verse is saying is since Jesus was tempted, he knows what he is talking about. Okay, so he can be merciful to us because he went through it too, he understands. So it gives him like, I guess you could say an edge, okay? Uh, but uh, with that being said, how did he suffer when tempted? Because it says here, for since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, we know that he suffered, like for, for instance with his death and all that. 
Uh, but how how did he suffer suffer when he was tempted? And I have basically four different things I want to say about this. Uh, first off, being in the lowly position that he was in, from God to man, that was suffering. Okay, he 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 left he left his uh, his claim on the land until basically you got the prince and the pauper situation going on. He had, he had it all, put it away in order to serve us. So that obviously was a, um, was a suffering. But I think it was a little bit more than that because uh, struggling with, he was struggling with temptation. So there was temptation in his life and he was struggling with it. That's, that's a little bit of uh, that's suffering right there. And then there's a third part to it. And I think the NLT really covers this. Temptation itself is a form of suffering. So not just the act of struggling with temptation, but re- having Having temptation that's in your life that you have to deal with, that itself is a suffering that comes on us, um, which obviously came on him as well. Uh, so the, I think the NLT really, the New Living Translation, I think really summarizes it very well. It, it reads, he was, he, tes- he was tested and suffered. Um, so I think that that really uh, says it very well. Uh, so that takes us to a couple questions that I want to ask, and I just want to say right off the bat, there is no right or wrong answer as far as I can tell. Okay, so don't feel like your answer is going to be stupid. It's not. Um, oh, I did want to make this note. I, I, I put here, side note. <laughs> uh, especially, you're, we're getting into the holidays. It's going to be very easy. There's going to be a lot of, time, a lot of people who are kind of hurting at this time of year. Uh, and with that being said, uh, don't fall into a very um, common trap. Uh, and that's the idea that you know what someone else is going through, okay? We all do this. Somebody says that they're going through something, and say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't know exactly how you feel. Um, I have no idea the things that you guys have gone through. I have no idea what that felt like. I have no idea. Even for those who have gone through, uh, those of us who have gone through similar situations, we all handle those things differently. You know what I mean? Like, you can get objectively, you can understand what somebody else is going through, but you don't really know what they're, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can have cancer, and somebody else can have cancer, and you still don't know what they're going through because their life is totally different, and they ha- they're they a totally different personality. Uh, it's easy to say things like, I know exactly what you're going through, but, but you don't. <laughs> you don't. Um, so I just want to warn you against that. Um, I, mean, I, I told the, the story that, that I hope this nobody gets overly f- upset about this. It was uh, my, my mom died, and uh, some guy goes up to my dad, and he says, you know, I really think I know exactly how you feel because my dog died a couple weeks ago. Like you don't, it's not <laughs> you're comparing apples to oranges. Like it just, <laughs> you don't know. So I'm just saving us all the irritation later when somebody inevitably gets upset. Don't come in hot with I know exactly how you feel. You don't know exactly how they feel. Uh, just listen and you know that kind of stuff. So uh, back to the back to the questions. First off, was it possible? For Jesus to sin, why or why not? Now, he just said in verse, um, just to give the, con- the question context, in verse 18, he said, Since he himself, being Jesus, has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. So the question becomes, okay, so he, he had temptation, but was Jesus actually able to sin? What do you guys think? What would you say? You don't think so? Why don't you think so? Good answer, sweetheart. Um, okay. Okay, so we have two no's because he was God. Okay. Melissa? So we have one yes and two no's. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? That was actually a really good point. Uh, it, Rick made the made the comment uh, in case there's anyone watching online uh, that you know what? Do you want to just say it over again in the mic? So, Melissa told the story of uh, the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness, and obviously Satan felt like it was possible for. Jesus to sin, otherwise he would have not even tried 
to tempt him. Anybody else? Like I say, I, I don't think that there is a right or wrong answer on this one. I kind of fluctuate between the two most of the time. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, I, I will say uh, there's a couple verses that I wanted to pull out that are worth considering in the conversation, not to say that there's one way or another. Uh, threefold. I forgot to mention references for them, but I'll try to do my best to say where it's from. He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I actually don't remember where that one is from. Let me think. No, I don't remember where that was from. God is not tempted to do evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. That one's from James. It is impossible for God to lie. That one's from Hebrews. I don't remember where that first one's from. Uh, so, I mean, if if your answer is, is yes, there are some verses that are kind of troublesome, but if your answer is no, there's also some areas that are a little bit persnickety to kind of get around. My My personal take on this is, I usually side on the idea that it's not possible for Jesus to sin. In my opinion, not you know, I'm not trying to persuade anybody here. I'm just sharing my own my own opinion. Um, and the reason why I land on this is because I see God's two characters as not at odds with one another. He was fully God and fully man, and it's not a trait of humans. Let me see that. Let me be very careful how I say this. It's it doesn't make us human to be able to um, to always choose sin. Let me say it differently. Adam in the garden was not created with sin, and sin only entered the equation wherein he chose something. So we know that it is possible to be, you know, in a in a human state without having that. Um, that sin thing. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a tricky c- c- conundrum, and I'm trying not to go too much because the next question, I don't want f- it to affect your guys' answers. So I'm just going to stop there, and we're just going to go to the next question. Are people born in sin? And if so, was Jesus born in sin too? We're talking about the idea of original sin. Okay, if, if you guys have, uh, in theology books, it's normally called original sin. The idea that we are born with sin, not just that we are sinners, you know, we sin, but also we were born in sin. Are people born in sin, and if so, was Jesus born in sin? So then, are people not born in sin? We are? Okay, so how do you get around the issue of him not being born in sin? Because he was born as a, uh, he was born of the flesh, so... So how do you get around that issue? How come it didn't go to him when he was born? Hold on, let me stop you right there. So you're saying he was born in sin? Okay. Okay, so you're saying he was born in sin, but he didn't sin. Okay, all right. Just want to clarify there. Anybody else? Tricky one, isn't it? (laughs) It's a tricky one. Okay, so basically, okay, so basically, what you're saying is, when Jesus was conceived in the womb, you're saying he did not use any of Mary's pre-existing material; he used his own divine material and just placed it in the womb. Okay, all right. Anybody else? These are difficult questions, am I right? <laughs> You don't think he was born in sin? Why not? That's all right. Mommy wrote no, and then she left. <laughs> She's like, I don't know what this conversation is going to do, but no. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else want to weigh in? Want to throw their thoughts out there? No? Okay, if you guys want to say anything else, just kind of wave at me or something, okay? I'm going to give four different views. Um, all of them are biblical, so you don't have to worry about uh, about that there. But 
So the Bible is very, very much so clear that people are born in sin. Um, I mean, you're going to have a really hard time trying to disprove that. But obviously that brings us, brings us the issue of, well, Jesus was born as a person, so how did, how did that not go to him? And there's basically four solutions. Solution number one, sin comes down through the man, not the woman. Uh, this is, I mean, it, 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 it's an idea. I don't know exactly how I feel about it. Uh, so we all know that Eve was the one who sinned first. But if you're reading in Romans, it talks about how sin entered the world through one man, not through the woman. Uh, so this, this, that's kind of, you just kind of take a couple verses there and just kind of roll with it there. The reason why I'm not super sold on that idea is because it seems to me like Paul is talking more as man in the sense of, you know, yes, Adam, but like more generally speaking, you know what I mean? Like came in through, I don't know, it just, I, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I'll just, I'll just leave it there because I don't want to really sway your opinion on this. Uh, uh, option number two, sin nature isn't sin, it's an inclination. Okay, so basically your sin nature doesn't mean that you are born uh, as already have sinned just by being born. Rather, when you are born, what your sin nature means is that you have an inclination towards evil. Uh, as a person, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you will always have the desire in you to sin. That's the only way I can think of to say that. Option number three, and I do want to mention, though, before I get going, that if you, uh, if you give credence to Rick's idea that, you know, he did not use, um, use Mary's preexistent, you know, matter, this does kind of circumnavigate the whole issue because that would mean that he was a human, but he didn't have any human material, or <laughs> of our human material. <laughs> but it raises up another problem that you... It, this this problem is easily easily rectified, but there is still the problem there of if he used if the Holy Spirit used divine <coughs> divine matter would that really constitute being born as a human? I think it would, but it's a discussion that would inev inevitably come up. So point number th or option number three: the sin nature passes down spiritually, not physically. I don't really understand this one, and I don't really see how it. But it, it, it could be that, I, I think it's kind of a slippery slope argument, because if you make the argument that uh, sin passes down spiritually, you turn it into more of, sin is more of a ambiguous idea out there, you know, it's more of these, like, um, I, I don't know, it just doesn't really seem that, once, I, I shouldn't have said that, because I, I really don't want to sway your guys' opinion. Uh, option number four, God prevented it in Jesus. So basically, uh, people, yes, they have the human nature, but when it came down to Jesus being born, God basically think of it as, sh as a shroud of invisibility around the baby in the womb, and it just kind of, God stopped it from happening, from spreading. Uh, in that sense, it would have been kind of like a cheat, uh, but not really when you consider the fact that, once again, Adam was also born, uh, or created, without uh, sin. So, uh, okay. Those are, the, those are the four different options you're going to see out in most different uh, books, and you can take it for whatever it is. Um, you're saying if it was and you're saying in response to the first question oh this first question okay I thought you were talking about the previous okay yes I, 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 I understand now I, I got it so if if we were not and you were able to make it 20 to 20 well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a philosophical, philosophical answer, and you can take it for whatever it is, okay? People say this. They say, where did sin come from? And my answer is always the exact same. Sin is not a thing. It is a decision. It is a decision to do something that goes against God's standard of perfection. Okay, So if that's true, and sin is not some boogeyman that was created, but rather a choice to do something that is against God's character, then we can say this. Why did Adam and Eve sin in the, sin in the garden? They sinned because it was an inevitability. So God, his character, is perfect and flawless. It is impossible for him to sin. Man, on the other hand, was not created as God. 
We are made in the image of God, but our essence is not God. Does that make sense? We are not a spark of the divine. We are a creation of the divine. So with that being said, we, not being created as God, will inevitably sin. It's a, it's, a, it's a foregone conclusion, something that will eventually happen. So God creating us in the garden, it was just a matter of time before we disobeyed because we don't have that God nature. We don't have that God spark. In this philosophical view, that would mean that then when sin entered the world, it didn't, it, what basically what it did is it tainted, it didn't make something imperfect. So in other words, we already, by our nature, by our creation, even with Adam, we're not perfect. See what I mean? We were already created with a flaw in the matrix <laughs> because we weren't that. So with the resurrected body, that will resolve that dilemma. See what I mean? And so in that view, the answer to this would be it would be impossible to reach 20 years old even if we weren't born into sin because we have that lack in us it's just going to happen eventually. If Adam would have hypothetically sinned, I'm mean, sorry, died before he sinned, he still wouldn't have been perfect. He just wouldn't have um, sinned yet. Does that kind of make sense? So as far as that, that, that applies, it doesn't tell us how long it was before Adam sinned. But assuming, is we're going to go on, on a little bit of an adventure here, Let's assume that Jesus, I mean, that Adam didn't sin and then he died before he sinned. It seems to me that he would go to heaven without needing a Savior. Because if we could have attained that by ourselves, isn't that, what, I think that, I think that maybe doesn't Peter say that or something, somewhere around, along the lines of that? If we could attain it by ourselves and the, maybe Paul says that. Then it, it the, then it, his his sacrifice would have been in vain. Remember that part that you, you know what I'm talking that part that I'm talking about. Right. Right. Uh huh. Right. Right. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, did did I did I answer your question? <laughs> did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I got lost in I got lost in the funness of that. I just I had a really good time with that. So, I, I, it happens to us all, I guess. Uh, Danny, were you gonna say something? So that that that's a ra- that that's a huge issue that has so much complexity to it. And let me just say right off the top, we don't know. Ultimately, there's a lot of arguments, but there really is no solid answer because Scripture never says, here is a solid answer. So some of the some of the arguments that people make, and I'll make this very quickly so we can get on with this. Eh, we're probably not going to get real far on the state anyways. Uh, there's a, the, some people kind of argue for the idea of the age of accountability. So in other words, God just kind of lets things go, so to speak, until you're mentally mature enough. Uh, then there is also the idea that God judges di- different people differently, just like a, a judge would. I mean, he takes into account their past and their history. So, like, for instance, um, in that view, uh, a mentally um, retarded person would be judged more leniently than someone who has a very high IQ and is, is, is fully uh, cognitively aware. Does that kind of make sense? He kind of doesn't really just do a blanket thing. He kind of takes into every certain person. You know, you get what I'm saying? Like, so basically just like our judges do, where they'll say, okay, well, this is your history, so I'm going to be more lenient on you. You know what I mean? And there, there's more ideas than that, but it, once again, this is a whole big, long thing that ultimately we don't know. <laughs> uh, I would like to think that my son is is not in hell. <laughs> that would be a very, very disturbing thought for me. Uh, but ultimately, and I want you to understand what I'm really saying here, it's not my business. You get what I'm saying? Like, there's some things that God does that he does that that's, it's just not my concern. Like, it's it's not my place. You know what I mean? So I just have to c- trust that he's good, because he says that he's good. He showed me that he's good, and I just kind of have to trust that. And then I have to kind of just step back and say, okay. You know what I'm saying? So, do you get what I'm saying, or you're kind of just staring at me? A little bit? 
See, this is why I, I kind of, my, my view of, of original sin is that original sin isn't an offense. Original sin is a predisposition. That is something that, you know, you are, you are predisposed to sin, as sin being the original sin. I, I don't, I'm not sure if God counts a newborn baby as a sinner before they really have a chance to choose sin. See what I mean? I, I don't know. But once again, as I mentioned, that's not really, <laughs> that's not my area of the game. <laughs> Our area of the game is in witnessing and that kind of stuff. It's like kind of, so the, you're not going to get a good answer from this. It's not going to, there's not going to be an open, shut thing, and you're not going to like it. And that's just, <laughs> I mean, I, I know a lot of people have wasted a lot of years trying to get an answer on this, and they never got anywhere because the Bible never says, hey, yes, or hey, no. So <laughs> It was, it was actually funny, Danny. There was something that, that reminds me of this. Um, I asked my daughter a question. Yes, you, Teresa. I asked her a question, and she went off on this very lengthy story about, well, I'm actually not really sure what it was about, but long story short, uh, five or ten minutes later, I said, okay, hold on. Yes or no? And I had to kind of repeat the question because she was already lost, too. She was on whatever it is that she was talking about. And so I had to kind of reel her back in and say, okay, but hold on. So did you do this, yes or no? And it, it's kind of like that. You know, God doesn't give us a solid yes or no. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Um, Therefore, holy bro- we got time. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So since, since he can't help, that's the therefore, therefore, holy brothers and sisters, since he can't help, because remember in chapter 2, I'll remind you since we kind of got uh, into some discussions there, uh, chapter 2 ended with, he is able to help those who are tempted. So then we get into chapter, chapter 3. So, therefore, since he can help us, cons- we, share, uh, 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 we share in hev- heavenly calling, cons- consider Jesus. And the word there, consider, excuse me, uh, it, it kind of has the idea of, of um, if you have the NIV or somewhere around there, it's probably going to say something like, fix your thoughts on maybe. Um, the idea is kind of a careful consideration. You're, you're really paying attention to analyzing something. Um, so consider Jesus. Pay, pay special attention to Jesus. Uh, and then um, uh, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, how he refers to us here is he calls us holy brothers and sisters. The idea of holy is basically being set apart. But this relates to chapter, chapter 2 again because he said that Jesus was making atonement for us. So the idea of him calling us holy here has to do with us being made pure. We've, the atonement has been made. So since he made atonement. Uh, if you notice here, uh, this might be the only situation in the New Testament, or I guess I could say scripture, where Jesus is referred to as an apostle. Um, I think it's a little bit confusing uh, because in English, when we think of an apostle, we might think of things a little bit differently. Maybe if you look up like apostle in English, you're going to find something along the lines of maybe a teacher or something like that. Well, uh, this translates a, a Greek word, really original, guys, really hard to remember, apostolos. Wow, so hard to remember. And the idea of that Greek word is kind of more of an envoy or a messenger. Um, so as it applies to here, um, consider Jesus the apostle, I think we could kind of substitute with maybe some other words to help us think about this, okay? Consider Jesus the, the, the one who was sent with the message, the, the messenger. Um, the, in a way, there's kind of an idea of an ambassador, but not, 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 not overly. Um, I think you could say, uh, just a real good way there, um, a revealer. I think that that would be a good way to, to kind of make it in English where you kind of understand the flow here. Consider Jesus the revealer of our confession. You know, he's, he's gone forward with the message, and that message is our confession. You know, it's, it's what we're holding to. Um, <coughs> and uh, so he says here, who, um, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in a heavenly calling? And uh, so we all share in the same calling, which is a heavenly one, not an earthly one, the same, the same goal. Um, um, so carefully consider Jesus, who is our example. And this is the important point, okay? Because in, in, in Israel's, in, in Jewish thought, Moses is the, uh, kind of like the most important character, okay? Uh, and so there's kind of this idea of, instead of considering Moses, instead of putting such high hopes on Moses, consider Jesus. And then you get into chapter 2, and he kind of makes that more clear. 
he was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was in all God's household. Because remember, you're, you're a Jew, you're going to this, you, you have very high views of Moses, and instead of saying consider Moses and the law, he's saying no, consider Jesus, and then he starts bringing up Moses, and there's a whole different shift there. So uh, he was faithful, Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all God's household. And he's, he's going to kind of stick with the idea of household for a couple of verses here. Uh, but the idea of verse 2 is that Jesus was faithful to God's task just as Moses was. So then we get to je- verse 3 and he says this. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses just as the builder has more honor than the house. So uh, a couple of things here. First off, Moses is part of the house that Jesus built. Moses is part of the house that Jesus built. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses just as the builder has more honor than the house. So Moses is a part of the house. Um, And then that takes us to a couple different ideas that I want to kind of tie in from Jewish thought. The first is that uh, the Jews were looking for the new Moses. Um, This was prophesied in in Deuteronomy, where it's talking about there will be a prophet who comes like me uh, in Deuteronomy. And uh, so Jesus obviously is that, but the Jews were obviously not really into that they were kind of expecting another Moses guy <laughs> um, and then that takes us to a little bit of a uh, little bit of a uh, aspects that we could kind of highlight from what he's saying here first off uh, Moses was the giver of the law well Jesus was the giver of the law uh, Moses you know had the whole law thing going on but but Jesus was the fulfillment of the law he wasn't Moses only took us to the law and then stopped there uh, Jesus took was the fulfillment of it Jesus was the creator Moses was a leader of God's people. Well, Jesus was a leader of God's people. I mean, there's actually a little bit of a little bit of a wordplay, um, even with the name of Jesus. So uh, in Hebrew, there, there's there's the name Joshua, right? Uh, Joshua is the guy that leads Israel into the Promised Land. Joshua is the guy in Ezra and Nehemiah who leads the people back into the Promised Land. And Jesus is Greek, uh, which is in Hebrew Joshua. Jesus' name is Joshua. Uh, so Joshua, is, again, is leading the people out of captivity. So you have this kind of repetition of the name of, name of Joshua, um, which is kind of a little bit of, uh, this is how the wordplay fits in. Joshua came after Moses. Jesus came after Moses. So, um, okay. Uh, moving on from there, um, that takes us to verse 4. 